You know what? Last week we we looked at ladies being first to the empty tomb of Jesus. And if you missed these messages, I don't know how many of you check them out, I, but uh, they are on YouTube. They're pretty easy to find, and I post, post them on Facebook. It's not to say, look at me, believe me, because I've been very, very hesitant to do that. But, you know, I believe in putting the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, out there for people to see. And there are a few people watching them, but anyway. Ladies first. Ladies were the first in the empty tomb of Jesus. Why did they? Why were they first? You know, we talked about it out of a sense of duty, and I think that's a little bit the case. Man, Angel and I talked about it on the way back home last last week, and she she said she reminded me, yeah, the women pretty much were the ones that might have went and spiced the body, put spices around the body to try to slow the decaying process. Uh, so that was, and maybe that little bit of nurturing aspect that women tend to have more than men do. And maybe just a dab more faith, you know. Uh, women might have just had a little bit more faith. And, but when you read the scripture, it doesn't tell you, nobody really thought about him rising again. So they lost that, but who knows. You know, they wanted to go in spite of their fear and depression. It, you know, the authorities were looking for followers of Christ, trying to arrest them. So that was the fear factor. The depression, they have lost a man that they had been had known for at least three years. A man had done miraculous things. you got to think, most of the people saw him, saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. And other miracles. You know, the men, by, if you read between the lines, they just sort of moped around. The women the first to rise up and take care of the business that need to be tended to. It may have just been one of those things. Okay, we got to go one more time. We're going to put these spices and herbs and perfumes and whatever, anoint the body, whatever they did. One more time, and we can close it up, seal it up, and all that kind of stuff, and that's it. But if you look closer, and that's what I encourage you to do as I've, as I've gone through this, I, I'm actively looking at those little areas of the post-resurrection, of the empty tomb scene that, that we just maybe we skip over because Easter's I mean, normally in this Easter's over, Jesus is risen, Hallelujah, Amen, praise God, and on that, and we, we we move on to the next situation. As a, as a preacher, I do, and I my goal is not to do that uh, this time, but to look for those little obscure things. But if you look at that closely, you see one woman stands out, and we talked about her last week. She's, she stands out among those first ladies. Mary Magdalene. She seems to be the leader of the women. Now again, it should go without saying when I prepare these messages, I read this stuff pretty thoroughly. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, but as I read through it, read through it, I said, well, she, you know, why is she prominent? You know, maybe she was the leader of, of the women. Uh, you know, or they, or they were more followers. She had the leadership kind of personality, whatever. I don't know. But, but anyway, she seems to be the leader of them. But why? You know, I think Mary Magdalene stands out. Now, obviously, this is where the message comes from. Because she was desperately seeking Jesus. That's my take on it. Now, I'm obviously up. Holy Spirit willing, Lord, let me communicate that to you. But she was desperately seeking Jesus. You know, in Luke's account that we read last week, Mary Magdalene, the other women, and Peter go to the tomb. You know, they're back and forth. The women go first, they run back to the other men, and Peter comes. In Luke's account, it sort of ends there in that aspect of it. But 
John we're going to read this morning, he gives us more details. Now, if you read closely, again, now you're going to hear that fairly frequently, if you read closely, and it just struck me this morning as I went back through this, John was there. John was there. John was there. And he gives us more details to maybe give us some reasons why Mary Magdalene might have been a little bit desperate. Now, Lord, let me tie all this together because I don't want to give it away. There's a reason why John may give us more details, and I'll share that with you later. And desperation, I will tell you this, the word desperation has a negative connotation in our time and culture. We'll come back to that, too. So, Lord, let me tie all this stuff together. Let's pick the story up in John chapter 20, 11 through 17. In the preceding verses, though, we see John and Peter at the empty tomb, and they still do not believe in the resurrection. In the verses preceding what I'm about to read, picking it up in, in verse uh, 20. 11 through 17. Mary was standing outside the tomb. Now Mary had come with her. Mary was standing outside the tomb. And so as she wept, she stooped in and looked into the tomb. So Mary's crying. Stooping down, looking in the tomb. Oh, you know, all that. She's stooping down. I, I can't do a good uh, imitation of crying. And she beheld two angels in white, in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, and this is the angels, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, behold, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So she's conversing with the two angels. And when she had said this, she turned around and behold, Jesus standing there, and she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Again, I encourage you, please, when I, when I emphasize it, read it again a couple, two or three times and you really pick up the scene. You know, here's in her eyes. Mary Magdalene looks at the empty tomb. Two angels ask, Why are you crying? My Lord is gone. My Lord is gone. He's gone. Someone has taken him away. A person, a person that we, that we know is Jesus, Ask, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Jesus, who are you seeking? Who are you seeking? Mary, tell me where you just tell me. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Tell me where you, please tell me where his body is and we'll, we'll 
says, Mary, Mary. And she said, oh. I don't know if she recognized the voice because she said she, she saw him but didn't know who he was thinking he was a gardener now. You know, it's this supernatural thing. I don't know what happened. Did, did she something in the voice? Because he'd already said something to her. Did he just recognize the voice? Or did her eyes just so suddenly open up like we we'll probably look at next Sunday when we revisit the road to Emmaus? Mary. Mary. It's me. It's me, Mary. <coughs> My goodness. Rabbi. Teacher. Lord. Jesus. I see you. She found who she was desperately seeking. In her desperation. Okay. So, she thinks he's dead. She goes. The tomb's empty. The body's gone. She's freaked out. Then she sees it's Jesus. Now, I remember it, this, it, it, thank you, Lord, years and years and years of reading Scripture, it never ceases to amaze me when you understand it like you never understood it before. Amen. Does it happen to you? Yes. It does to me. Yes. I've always wondered about this passage. I've always wondered about this passage of Scripture. Stop clinging to me. Now, does that mean that she ran over and grabbed a hold of his uh, <clears throat> leg and just was hanging on to him and hanging on to him? Yeah, I think I can tell you. And just hanging on to him and clinging to him physically? I've always thought that was the case. <clears throat> How many of you have ever seen the movie Duel in the Sun. Forties, Gregory Peck and Jennifer Jones, one of the Barrymore brothers, and Lillian Gish. If you ever get a chance to see that movie, I'll, I'll tell you the point for this reason. There's a scene in it where Gregory Peck, he plays the mean, bad son, and I've got the other guy that plays the good son, the obedient son. And the, and the dad, the Barrymore guy, there's a point to this for the message. The Barrymore guy, John, yeah, he, he, he favors the mean, bad son. And, and, the, and the girl that sort of the, works there on the ranch, she falls for the Gregory Peck character. And there's a scene, I'm going, I forgot what her name was now. I'm leaving you, I'm leaving you. I'm, I'm, I'm going. I, I gotta be. I gotta be moseying on. And she literally grabs a hold of his leg. No, oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. He's doing. He's doing. Dragging her across the top of the floor. Again, that's worth. It's, it's a good movie. It's one of those old classic '40s westerns. I think John Ford or one of those guys, the director, did it. Sunsets and all that kind of stuff. She, she grabbed on the thing, leave me home, I gotta go, you know. Anyway, I don't think that's what Mary was doing. I don't think so. I don't think that's what she was doing. She wasn't, it doesn't mean necessarily physically clean. I assume that she touched Jesus. She might have gave him a, a hug. I don't think so. Wouldn't you do it? If you were Mary Magdalene or Peter or John or any of those people and you saw Jesus and you thought he's dead, he's alive, wouldn't you go hug him? Come on now. I would. I might have grabbed a hold of his leg like that in that movie, you know, grab a hold of him. And, and I don't want to be pulled. I don't want him to go away. So whether it's physical or not, he says, stop clinging to me. I must go to heaven. I have to go to heaven. This is not it. It doesn't end right here. Yeah, it's good. I'm alive and all that. And you believe and all that kind of stuff. Man. But there's more I have to do. I have to move on. Go 
tell everyone about this. You know, Mary Magdalene is an interesting person. Even though she's only mentioned 12 times in the Bible, in all of the New Testament, and 11 of those, it's associated with the crucifixion, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. 11 of the 12. The other time, Luke and Mark both tell us that she was possessed with seven demons. That's all we know about. That's really all we know about. You know, one demon is bad enough. I mean, we all deal with demons and stuff that, you know, what those seven were, I don't know. The scripture just does not tell us that. One of the most loyal followers of Christ. She was from the town of Magdala. Where she got her name, I think it was up in the northern part of the area of Galilee, Nazareth area. I think she was from that general area. But Magdala. You know, there's been much speculation about her through the centuries. The most famous one is a prostitute. Jesus' is wife. Jesus walked in there. He walked in there. And it struck me again. Do you think Jesus would have married somebody, him knowing what his ultimate destiny was going to be? That he was going to die a horrible death for the sins of mankind. He was going to ascend to heaven to be to send the right sit at the right hand of God the Father and Almighty. The second person of the Trinity is the second person of the Trinity going to marry a human being? No. And all these liberals that try to say that they try to make Jesus more human than he really was. That is, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day, borderline blasphemy. I can't remember who was talking about blasphemy or heresy or whatever. That is not the case. But I did find this interesting. There's some speculation, I didn't know this, that she might have been John's wife. The Apostle John. And I said, hmm, that makes a little bit of sense to me. John was relatively young. He was one of the young apostles. John lived a full life. He was the only one that died a natural death. Basically, and again, it's speculation. And I said, that makes sense to me. It might have been John's wife. Speculation aside, speculation aside, I believe we can say Mary was desperately seeking Jesus. I told you about the negative connotation. Feeling an urgent <coughs> need. I think Mary was that way. Frantically looking. Making the final and ultimate effort. I see that. Again. Giving something your all. Again, if you look closely at her, you see all of this. I see in her positive desperation. Positive aspect of desperation. You know, there's nothing wrong you know, some people say, oh, I, I you know, I got to tell you something, brother. I got to tell you something, sister. And you, and if you ever run into somebody that shares something with you, maybe very intimate or whatever, and it's like, and you sense a desperation in them, and you're the chosen vessel for them to just spill themselves, put like a priest kind of situation. It does happen. Do you need to be desperate? Seeking Jesus. To feel an urgent need to seek Jesus. To frantically seek Him. Giving Him all your being. That's what Mary Magdalene definitely did. She he definitely. You know, she sets an, an excellent for us to follow. You know, you know where I'm going next. Y'all heard me preaching those messages. You know, will you follow her example? Will you? You know, by desperately seeking Jesus. You don't have to use the desperate part. You can just seek Jesus. But there needs to be in, in some
sometimes in our lives an urgency. Maybe a little bit frantic. Oh Lord, I need you, man. I need you. I need you with me. I think that never goes away. 